Welcome to the Stop and Think series. I'm Will Markham. It's a series dedicated to training not on what to think but how to think so that you can dissect all the BS on your own. And lesson number five is on false flags. Now what is a false flag? Well, here's an example for you. It's odd, but when I hired Vazini to have her murdered on our engagement day, I thought that was clever. But it's going to be so much more moving when I strangle her on our wedding night. Once Gilda is blamed, the nation will be truly outraged. They'll demand we go to war. <laughs> ah. Are you coming down into the pit? Wesley's got his strength back. I'm starting him on the machine tonight. Tyrone, you know how much I love watching you work. But I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan, my wedding to arrange, my wife to murder, and Gilda to frame for it. I'm swamped. Now this type of false flag is the classic frame and blame. It's when the attack is real, but someone else is being framed for it. Now there's another type of false flag that started happening once movie films became more popular around the globe. For example. The precedent for economic hitmen really began back in the early 50s when democratically elected Mossadegh who was elected in Iran. He was considered to be the hope for democracy in the Middle East and around the world. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But one of the things that he'd run on and began to implement was the idea that foreign oil companies needed to pay the Iranian people a lot more for the oil that they were taking out of Iran. The Iranian people should benefit from their own oil. Strange policy. We didn't like that, of course. But we were afraid to do what we normally were doing, which was to send in the military. Instead, we sent in one CIA agent, Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's relative. And Kermit went in with a few million dollars and was very, very effective and efficient. And in a short amount of time, he managed to get Mossadegh overthrown and brought in the Shah of Iran to replace him, who always was favorable to oil. And it was extremely effective. Mobs overflow to Iran. Army officers shout that Mossadegh has surrendered and his regime as virtual dictator of Iran is ended. Pictures of the Shah are paraded through the streets as sediment reverses. The Shah is welcomed home. So back here in the United States, uh, in Washington, people looked around and said, wow, that was easy and cheap. So this established a whole new way of manipulating countries, of, of creating empires. So this was a new way in conducting false flags, where everything is fabricated. These faked attacks include the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which got us into the Vietnam War. This here is a clip from Secretary of State Robert S. McNamara talking about the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And events afterwards showed that our judgment that we'd been attacked that day was wrong. It didn't happen. And also Desert Storm. The one that got us into that war was also totally fake. They took the babies out of the incubators. Took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. Now these false flags are something you probably already know about. But did you know about this frame and blame false flag? The Arabian government paid to help fund the attacks of 9-11 the FBI knows it, and the FBI covered it up. That's off some freaky website, right? Not this one. This one is the claim of the flo former senator from Florida, Senator Bob Graham, who was on the Intelligence Committee. Not some quack conspiracy theorist, but the former head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He co-wrote a congressional report on the attacks of 9-11, and he says classified pages, 28 classified pages of that report, could help prove his damning allegations. Now, what Senator Graham wants released is something I suspect he has already seen. Why do you suspect that? Because he was chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee in 2004 when the Senate, uh, rep when the when the 9/11 Commission report was released, and President um, uh, Bush ordered. 28 pages held secret, and President Obama has reconstituted that order. So two executive orders holding it in secret. Those 28 pages are about the Saudi government's involvement in 
the writers of that report, former New Jersey Governor Tom Kane and former Indiana Congressman Lee Hamilton, the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission report, want those 28 pages released. Senator Graham wants those 28 pages released. We don't know what's in those pages, except that we do know it pertains to the Saudi government and two American presidents don't want it released. Add to this the following. Last year, President Obama signed an agreement with Saudi Arabia to provide for the sale of 60 billion, with a B, dollars worth of weaponry over the next 10 years from American arms merchants to the Saudi government. You have a very dangerous stew here. Senator Graham, many of our viewers may remember him. He's the one who knocked off Jeb Bush for governor of Florida at one point. Right. Powerful senator. When you're on the Intelligence Committee, you know a lot. And, and what the government reveals to you when you're on the tele Intelligence Committee, they make you take an oath not to reveal to anybody. So you're sort of hamstrung. Here you are, a popularly elected official who's made promises to the voters who've elected him, and you know these horrible truths and you can't reveal them. You may recall Senator Feinstein got around this by yeah. revealing this, the, the evidence of torture on the floor of the Senate, where she cannot be prosecuted or sued for what she says. Former Senator Graham no longer has access to the floor of the Senate because he's a former senator. So he cannot reveal these awful truths that he believes the American public wants to know and has a right to know, even though I suspect he knows them. Think what he's alleging. He's alleging that the Saudi Arabian government knowingly funded an organization that was about to c uh, commit an act of war against the United States. If what Senator Graham is saying is true, that's an act of war. Well, he's also we alleging... killed 3,000 of our people. He's also alleging the flip side of this, which is that the American government knows about this. And and, it up. Uh, correct. Two presidents. After these 28 pages were declassified, they were never reported on again. The 28 pages reveal that the attack originated from the Saudi government, but we invaded two enemy countries over it instead. Now, there's a whole lot of other shady things about 9-11. But for now, suffice it to say that 9-11 is a declassified false flag event. And since 9-11, our government has spent a whole lot of money on fake news and fake events to further along the regime change agendas. During the Iraq war, we spent $500 million to create fake videos about the terrorists we were fighting. We have become an empire of illusion. Okay, I think he's got one. Hey, uh, on your number 10, where you're saying how well, you know, the whole, you know, martial law, uh, what do you think of what happened in Boston? When we were looking oh, for bombing? a pressure cooker and two teenagers, you know, and then they took over the whole city and shut it down. And to me, that looked a whole lot like martial law. Yeah. Um, oh, God, I can't believe. See, this is why I didn't want to give this talk, because I knew that we have this conversation and now it's on the record all right let me take a step back and no no you how we have to deal with it let me take a step back and a deep breath because this is a very painful thing to talk about um, so all over the world we know it's well established uh, the State Department and intelligence agencies engage in theater and it's what they do it's spycraft to create um, spectacles and events that people may not realize are spectacles and events, but that, well, like the, um, the overthrow of Mossadegh in the 50s in Iran. Uh, it, they, they'll funnel money to protesters, they'll, you know, fly people in to infiltrate protesters, they'll create fake newspapers, and so on. So we know that this happens in countries around the world. I believe that a law has been passed in the United States, I think it's part of the Defense Authorization Act, I need to confirm this, that, pardon me, now makes it legal to propagandize American citizens. Is that, do we know about that? Yeah, it's true. And is it in the NDAA or is it in something else do we know? It's a separate bill. It's a separate bill. And it's been passed. It's now law? Do we know what the name, two years ago. Do we know what the name of it is? I don't remember, but I reported on it. Oh, thank you. Will you send me the link? Yes. Thank you. So what this means is, and I, you know, as a journalist to say these words, just I can't tell you with what a heavy heart I say them, but we've entered an era in which it is not crazy to assess news events to see if they're real or not real. 
and in the United States as well as overseas. And in fact, it's kind of crazy not to. Now, there is a third type of false flag that we won't go into today. It's where there's a mixture of real and fake elements. This is where they take something real, but they add theater on top of it so they can politicize the hell out of it. So what are the signs, the red flags, that you are witnessing a false flag? Well, the first red flag is when you see the suppression of evidence. Any cover-up of evidence equals evidence of manipulation. Another red flag is when you see the attacking of witnesses. For example, when Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard flew out to Syria to see what is happening on the ground in Aleppo, she came back with information that went contrary to the narrative, that there are no moderate rebels, and that Obama was secretly funneling money and weapons to ISIS. Tulsi Gabbard then went to draft legislation called the Stop Arming Terrorists Act. The corporate networks, instead of applauding her for, for this discovery and legislation, chose to attack her instead. Another red flag is if you see that there's a drill of the same attack happening on the same day. Another red flag is if you happen to notice recycled actors that oddly show up from tragedy to tragedy. Another red flag is if the event is heavily politicized. When there's an agenda attached to the event, that's a red flag. Another big one is timing and convenience. Yeah, this one should kind of go without saying. If it's a little bit too convenient, yeah, that kind of speaks for itself. Another red flag is if the narrative for story is overly emotionalized and doesn't really make any logical sense. Now, I'm not saying that attacks on children do not happen, but the rarity of such attacks is enough to make you question if such is real or fake. Because you have to remember that there's a reason that whenever they propagandize an event, it almost always involves children. Why? Because otherwise, People don't care, and they need to get you to care. They have to get you emotionally involved and attached and triggered by the event. And this is why for the last six years, yes, six years, that every time there's a UN conference coming up about Syria, you will suddenly see reports showing up in the mainstream networks about Assad using chemical weapons on his own kids. It's getting really bad, really thick, and to the journalists on the ground in Syria, it's getting really obvious. Could you explain what you think might be the agenda from us in the uh, Western media? and why we should lie, why the uh, international organizations on the ground should lie, why we shouldn't believe all these uh, ac absolutely uh, documentable uh, facts that we see from the ground, these hospitals being bombed, these civilians who are talking about the atrocities that they have been experiencing. Um, how can you justify calling all of us liars? Sure. Thank um, you. I mean, there are certainly honest journalists amongst the very um, – compromised establishment media. Let's start with your second question. So international organizations on the ground. Tell me which ones are on the ground in Eastern Aleppo. Yeah, OK, I'll tell you, there are none. There are none. These organizations are relying on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in Coventry, UK, and which is one man. They're relying on compromised groups like um, the White Helmets, which let's let's talk about the White Helmets. The White Helmets were funded were founded in 2013 by a British ex-military officer. They have been fu uh, funded to the tune of 100 million dollars by the U.S., U.K., and Europe and other states. They purport to be rescuing civilians in eastern Aleppo and Idlib, yet no one 
in eastern Aleppo has heard of them. And I say no one, bearing in mind that now 95% of these areas of eastern Aleppo are liberated. The white helmets purport to be neutral, yet they can be found um, carrying guns and standing in the dead bodies of Syrian soldiers. And uh, their video footage actually contains uh, children that have been recycled in different reports. So you can find a girl named Aya who turns up in a report in month, say, August, and she turns up in the next month in two different locations. So they are not credible. The SOHR is not credible. Unnamed activists are not credible. Once or twice, maybe, but every time, not credible. So your sources on the ground, you don't have them. Um, as for your agenda, not your, but the agenda of some corporate media, it is the agenda of regime change. How can the New York Times, I was reading it this morning, or how can Democracy Now!, which I was reading the other day, maintain until this day that this is a civil war in Syria? How can they maintain until this day that, there were that the protests were unarmed and nonviolent until, say, 2012? That is absolutely not true. How can they maintain that the Syrian government is attacking civilians in Aleppo when every person that's coming out of these areas occupied by terrorists is saying the opposite? That finishes up our lesson on false flags, and here is what to look for. The suppression of evidence, the attacking of witnesses, a drill of the same attack, if there are any recycled actors, if the event is heavily politicized, if there is some very interesting timing and conveniences involved, and if the event is overly emotionalized. And that finishes everything. Be sure to comment with your thoughts and insights.